I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters related to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silver Core, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, services, and products that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silver Core Club, which includes 10 million in North America wide liability insurance to ensure you are properly covered during your outdoor adventures. In this podcast, I sit down with Marshall Lowen, a master firearms instructor, Canadian military veteran, master of the hunt, and elder in the Métis community. Marshall shares with me some interesting hunting stories, as well as his unique perspective on teaching firearms and hunting to Indigenous groups, and insight into fostering respect and understanding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities in Canada. Okay, Marshall, we're sitting down again. We had a lot of really great stories in our last podcast. And in this one, I'd like to expand upon your time as an instructor. Now you're a firearm safety course instructor. You're a master instructor. You're a hunter education instructor. You spend a lot of time teaching within your community and the Métis community. And there are differences that I've found being an instructor myself when relaying information to Indigenous communities as opposed to non-Indigenous communities. And there's a lot of misconceptions on both sides about where the rules are. And I was hoping we could sort of expand on that a little bit with the federal government having a, an initiative on Indigenous training. It's coming to pass that that's something that's being worked into the hunter education as well. And there's going to be, I'm sure, a lot of questions from the instructors and relaying this information. What advice would you have for an instructor who's teaching Indigenous history and hunting rights to non-Indigenous people? I think working, of course, you've got a wide spectrum. Mm. I mean, a lot of Indigenous people are living off reserve. Right. You've got people living on reserve. Um, one of the disadvantages that they have at this point was, for example, I was up in the Chilcotin, and they have state-of-the-art schools for the children. Right. And they have everything in there from basketball courts to, you know, all the modern conveniences, electricity, water, satellite got computer rooms, and a lot of the kids leave there and go home to basically a tar paper shack Mm -hmm. that has maybe television, but again, there's, what do they do outside of school? Mm -hmm. So a lot of them end up watching TV, getting, I think, a distorted idea of what's actually happening out there. Sure, sure. The life experiences of the people on reserve are going to be different than the ones who grow up. And we have the Musqueam, the Shlaiwatoth, the, you know, the Squamish here, who have much different experience and they have, say, up, you know, up the coast on isolated reserves. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that's important, which is shown within the native community is respect Mm -hmm. and the type of respect that they're going to look you know to the average you know outsider we'll say white person Mm -hmm. as introverted not outgoing and It's interesting when I look at some of the traits that I've come across. For example, in a community, a fellow is chopping wood and his friend comes along and he sits down and watches him. Right. He doesn't offer to help. It's what I call non-interference. Okay. And if the fellow asks for help, he'll give it. But... What I've found and experienced with a lot of the group is they don't ask for help. Interesting. Another thing that's kind of interesting is a lot of the people I've met have learned by watching, imitating, and try it again. 
Right. So if they see something, I, I was impressed when I was in Manitoba of a young fellow who was in his late teens who had made a fiddle. Really? Yeah. And he had watched the adults. He'd examined a fiddle. And he made a workable fiddle. I mean, it wasn't a Stradivarius. Sure. <laughs> but he'd made one, and he'd taught himself to play. Wow. By watching what the fiddlers were doing and looking at it from the point of view that, okay, he's doing this. Let me try that. No, that doesn't work. Let's check that again. Mm. Okay. You know, and trying it. You see... One of the interesting things is with the school system and with the lack of encouragement and the lack of future, a lot of the children wouldn't get a full education. Sure. The dropout rate in Aboriginal schools is much higher for Aboriginals than it is for non-Aboriginals. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're stupid. No. I was teaching, for example, different types of teaching, uh, firearms, but I was teaching carpentry okay. to Native people. Now, these are the people who made seagoing canoes, mm -hmm. totem poles, mm -hmm. but they didn't appear to be good at mathematics or science. <laughs> but they knew what they were doing. Sure. So when I had to explain geometry to them, have you looked at West Coast art? It's very geometric. Good point, yes. They've never studied geometry. How did they do it? You have to think. But obviously, people like Bill Reed, Susan Point, they're very, very talented. Mm -hmm. right? And their work is, in a lot of cases, magnificent. Sure. Now, not every Aboriginal is an artist, but there are a lot of Aboriginal artists. Mm -hmm. And so there is an ability there, but how do you access it? Now, people will talk about colonialism and the school system. I've had the chance to look at Aboriginal students as opposed to Chinese students. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese students want to learn by memory. They okay. want to know, you tell me what the answer is and I'll work towards it. Okay. Show me what, you know, and... In carpentry and what we're doing, sometimes there's more than one correct answer. Yes. Right? And that can baffle people. So in one case, I was able to put a group of Aboriginal carpentry students with a group of Chinese students. I teamed them. The Aboriginal students had the hands-on skills. Mm. They could use all the tools. But they had difficulty making the calculations. Sure. The Chinese, on the other hand, could do all the calculations and the science, but they had no hands-on. And the teams worked quite well. Yeah, they would. Right? It meshed together. And the other thing was a friendship struck up, that they started to find similarities in their culture. Really? Yeah. I mean, I have a fellow that I know who's Chinese, and he's actually Inuit. Okay. He went up to Baffin Island yeah. and ended up working with Hudson's Bay and then becoming a minister in the government and one thing or another. And to look at him, everybody thinks he's Inuit. His wife's Inuit, and so he's Inuit. <laughs> he speaks Inuit language. Yeah. You know, when you look at things, you know, the Mongolian type, and you look at the Inuit, yeah, you know, there's similarities. There's similarity. But what's happening is there's a conditioning. And I look at it in a different way. I've had some very promising students, one particular up country, who I was convinced one of the smartest kids I ever were. But he had a case of what I called learned helplessness. Right, okay. And he just didn't think he was capable of achieving anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Well, I'm, I'm no good at it. Mm -hmm. And so there's this reluctance. What I've done in the past is look for a link and kind of hard for somebody who had just taught what I call mainstream people. Mm -hmm. When we had the instructor class for Aboriginal instructors, the suits 
from Victoria uh, failed a lot of the potential instructors on the grounds, for example, oh, they didn't make eye contact with the audience. Right. Or they didn't speak in a loud, affirmative tone. And yet, these are cultural facts that you avoid eye contact. You don't have to make eye contact in, in a native community. It can be a, an insult mm -hmm. if you are staring at people, looking directly at them. Right. It's yeah. a bit equivalent to another one I know that in certain Asian countries, you don't point at people with your finger. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. <laughs> so, again, you have to be cognizant of what these people grew up with, and you don't know. You don't know if... They grew up in the city or grew up on a reserve. Mm -hmm. You don't know there's the real horror show of, you know, the, the schools. Right, yes. You know, um, so you have to look at that. And I've sort of learned this from having a couple of disabilities. I when I, uh, I get anxious and I think, you know, why isn't that person faster? And like, why is that person taking all that time? Right. And... I've had to realize that some people are having trouble with stuff. Maybe they're not as swift as me. Sure. Uh, maybe something has just happened to them. You know. Um, you know. You you have to. I think in a lot of ways, in what I do with a lot of students is, I put myself in their shoes mm -hmm. and think, where are they coming from? That appreciation is huge, and and I'd like to say understanding, but. Maybe you don't understand it, but what you said, respect. Well, you, for example, you know, my, my friend, I've got a native friend up country. He's a fisheries officer. We went up and did a whole bunch of courses up in Chilcot. So I meet him in Williams Lake at the uh, Chilcot National Government. <clears throat> and uh, we drive along in the car. And this is typical conversation. So how's it going? Dead silence. Five hmm. minutes later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are you busy at work? Another five minutes. Not really. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and this is the way he is. Okay. The yeah. other thing which we, I toy around with, and you have to be careful with this because you have, have to know it. Up in that area, there are some obsidian deposits. Right. And if you want to have a little bit of in fun, you ask them if they know where there's any black rock. Okay. And they get all funny with it. Oh, really? <laughs> They've yeah. been protecting the source of their black rock. I know where it is. But, sure. But, you know, um, I, was on a funny. I was on a trip with him, and the trouble is they're... They can be very introverted and they do a lot of thinking and they express themselves in different ways. There's a lot of body language going on. Okay. And it takes a while to be in tuned. I mean, I can sit at a fire with them at night and there'll be two hours without any conversation. And it's just body language or just... Yeah, just yeah. body language. People getting up and moving and people reading what other people... Somebody will get up, go over to the coffee pot, pour a cup of coffee, give it to you. Very different culture. Well, it is, and it, it's a slower culture. Mm -hmm. But asking questions in class is difficult because they don't want to be hung out. Sure. Um, terminology, I've found that one of the things you don't say, for example, okay, we're going to have the written test. Okay. I go, okay, um, I'm, I'm going to have to, I, I'm going to ask you some questions. It's non-confrontational. Uh, I do the exams orally. Mm -hmm. I read it out to them. Some, some of them have reading difficulty. I mean, it's not just there. I mean, I've got friends who have dyslexia. They're not good at reading. Sure. They don't want to be called out. They don't want to be centered out. They don't want to become the focus. Now, some cultures are very independent learners and others are group learners. Yeah. So indigenous communities, I know they have a, a very big emphasis on the group uh, training as a group scenario, as opposed to singling out as an individual, that would yeah. be a preferable way, I should imagine. 
Yeah. <clears throat> we did this. Um, you t what I try to do is integrate something, like I say, um, I guess it helps because I, I speak a little bit of native language. And um, if you get into their world and you ask them, okay, um, this is such and such, what do you call it in your language? Mm -hmm. And I, I explain this because my Lakota name is Mazawakan, and that's translated as many guns. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, my childhood name was Wanagi Awanyakapi, which means spirits watch over him. But then <laughs> when I did my vision quest, you know, got my other name. So, Interesting. But they, they get that. Uh, so, again, it's a bit of an icebreaker with them when, you know, I'm your instructor. You know, I, I don't say I'm your instructor. I'm here to show you some stuff and... Oh, that's a good one. That's a good tip. You know, I'm here to show you some stuff and explain some stuff to you. Mm -hmm. And again, you take the approach that you're there to help help them. You're not there over over them. Mm -hmm. That you come there as an equal. Mm -hmm. It helps with the native instructors again if you have that link. They they will equate that to some sort of empathy for what what they're experiencing, mm. like in a little bit of a bad way. It's like the Kanawaki uh, putting up a blockade to support the people in BC. Right. Okay. Right. Um, but what happens is if you appear to be helping them, then they'll accept it. But they won't ask for help. So back to your wood splitting yeah. analogy. In non-Indigenous culture, you come yeah. up to your friend's house, you see them splitting wood. Yeah. It's typically proper. You grab some wood, ask if you have another maul or axe. Yeah. You help out, get the job done. Yeah. That would be disrespectful. That would be intruding. Ah. And the fellow might be doing it. Maybe he's angry. <laughs> okay. And it's a way of, you know, doing it. That's a good point. You know, um, I always remember one of my friends from down at Musqueam, one of the fellows got a new boat. And one of the elders said to him, oh, that's a nice boat. Yeah. I could teach you a lot about fishing. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And left it at that. Yeah. It's up to him to ask. Okay. Right. They, they don't, in generality, but th there's no boasting or bragging. Okay. And the thing is, you've got to remember coming in as an instructor or teacher, they don't know you. That's a really good point. So they've got to assess you. So are you coming across as a superior being? Mm -hmm. Or are you coming across as, hey, I grew up in a community, I went to residential school. Mm -hmm. Then so, there's a bridge. There's that nexus there. And the thing is, again, um, they don't speak in a loud voice. That's why I'm wearing hearing aids now. It's, you know, a case of, you know. Uh, but again, I'm going to ask you some questions. I, I need you to show me how you handle a firearm. So we had a course that we're doing for a government organization that was dealing with an indigenous group. And our instructor went over, taught the course, came back. I talked with the instructor and he says, it was a great course. Everyone loved it. What a great group. It was fantastic. Well, good to hear. And then we hear back from the government organization. There's been a request. Some of the elders in the group were so incensed that they wanted to walk out of the course, but they didn't. The request is that that instructor never come back again. And so we pushed the government organization, like, that's terrible. What happened? What could we do better, right? He comes back, says, the elders said, it's done, it's over. We just never want to see that person again. And what you're mentioning here about loud talking, high energy, 
that's this instructor. So I'm wondering, perhaps. Well, there's one other thing that when I go on to a nation's traditional territory, the first thing I do is I acknowledge I'm proud to be here on traditional territory. Mm. Or I want to acknowledge that we are me having this meeting on the traditional territory of you know, such and such nation. It's just that simple yeah. sign of respect. Yeah. And the thing is, it would if there are elders there, it would be I would take the effort to acknowledge the elders. Hmm. And probably if I was on what I call sensitive area, a little bit of history, if you're up in the Gitsan, mm -hmm. you could start off acknowledging the Dalmagup, hmm. you know, acknowledging something that they've accomplished. You know, That's a good point. You know, I'm, you know, very happy to be on Haida territory and uh, the home of, you know, if you don't know, you can say the home of Bill Reed, hmm. famous artist, uh, please. And it's, it's, it's respect. It's not, I mean, what you're saying is true. You know, there are great people that have done great things. You look at, even down at Musqueam, you know, we have the Sparrow decision, the Gurin decision, mm -hmm. you know, and these people all have family links, you know. So what about on the other side with the indigenous teachings within the course to non-indigenous people? There's going to be a gap of understanding. And I'll give you an example. I was out in the Cranbrook area and was well past last light and we see a truck driving up the road with a light and these people were hunting with a spotlight and I take down the information and obviously my first thought goes to you can't do that you can't pit lamp you can't hunt after one hour after sunset but find out that it was an indigenous group and there's a different set of rules that uh, that seem to apply, which non-Indigenous groups will have a difficult time understanding. Uh, what what sort of rules, what sort of differences are there, and what's what's one way that a non-Indigenous group can better appreciate why these are in place? The, call it pit lamping, or, you know, um, there were several court cases, and the uh, the communities that were asking for this, had to prove that they basically it was a tradition. I know of one group on the island that traditionally they hunted deer at night with torches. Hmm. The deer will be attracted to light. So they would have to prove that it was a tradition that they were into. Now, other groups could prove this too. Um, I was aware that up in the Chilcotin area, they used to fish with a torch hmm. at night because the fish, and they would spear the fish. So this is something that they've done. Now, when you look at it, why, you have to look at the rationale of why would people be upset at this? I think it basically comes down to, if that was a, yeah. a non-rhetorical question, uh, the feeling of a different set of rules and why can they do when I can't sort of a um, an idea. So what you have to look at is a lot of the game rules that we have today were put in place because of market hunting. Right. That's why the largest gauge you can use is a 10 gauge mm -hmm. because people had punt guns and they'd knock out hundreds of ducks. Right. This is why there's a rule you can only have two shotgun shells in a magazine. Mm -hmm. Right. And there was, let's face it, they almost wiped out the buffalo. It wasn't mm -hmm. the natives that wiped out the buffalo. 
It was a market hunting. It was a market hunting. Mm-hmm. So when you look at, and, and it was the Métis in Canada that put in the first regulations on the buffalo hunt. I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. It was Cuspert Grant hmm. in Alberta. And they put in, they, they were concerned about, you know, the diminishing herds of buffalo. And they wanted to put in a limit of what people could take because of the tremendous waste that was going on. Right. So these rules were imposed not because of the native people and their traditions. Mm -hmm. It was because of market hunting and what the colonists were doing. I've always looked at the idea that uh, I've been up in the Kootenays and looking for a lost hubcap. Sure. I went into the ditch, and there was an animal skeleton on that highway, probably every 20 feet. Wow. I've pulled out on a morning coming back to Vancouver, driving from Cranbrook up to Golden. Mm -hmm. And I've counted on one, probably 20 elk killed on the highway. Wow. This had been one day. And... Too many deer splattered all over the place. The trucks come down there. They don't even stop when they hit a herd of elk. Right. Right? So you total that up over the year, and you wonder how many animals are killed and and, and never utilized. Some people go out with lights and get a couple of animals. Is that going to affect the overall population? Not really. This has been proven in courts. Mm. They said, well, this poaching affects... No, it'd be different if it was mountain caribou and it was only a small population. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's the way it's set up, um, yeah, there are cultural things. For example, you know, spearing fish. Okay. Um, okay, traditionally, you know, you spear one, one fish or a, a hundred salmon out of a stream. How is that going to affect the overall population of it? Or sure. is it what I call the jealousy of how come you can do it and I can't? I think that's where a big part is. There's yeah. a big us against them. And there's also optics. So we've all seen nets that go right across a river, and which is different from spearing a fish. But we've also seen, uh, let's say, back of the pickup truck, twice the limit of uh, what a non-Indigenous person would be able to take is in an Indigenous pickup truck. Now, I think yeah. that ties into individual and community rights as well, I think. When you look at what people are allowed to do, there's always people that will abuse it. Sure. So I think what you have to look at is poaching elk. Mm -hmm. Poaching elk on the island, a few cases there. Mm -hmm. The worst cases where people had just gone up there and slaughtered the elk and left them. Mm -hmm. Now, why did they leave them? Were they close to getting caught and they escaped? Or were they taking them? Now, yes, there are Native people who break the laws. Sure. Just like any group? Yeah, like any group out there. Similar thing I see in the Native communities, you know, up country is people who abuse the food banks. Mm. They go up to the food banks and they get food and then they sell it. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's wrong. Yeah. But... This is an interesting thing. Their neighbors don't turn them in. Hmm. Go back to my non-interference policy. Right. They know they're doing it. They don't condone it. Down the hill here, we have a fish-bearing stream. Right. Half the community is trying to rehab it. The other half of the community is throwing empty grocery carts and garbage in it. Sure. Which side's going to win? <laughs> yeah. Well, time will play out on what, that what's, one. What's going to lose? And then... A homeowner up here releases a chlorine-filled pool into the stream and kills off all of us, oh, all the fish. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's always going to be people doing things according to the rules, and they're not. I mean, you know, why do they turn around and you know the guys are out pit lapping? What are they going to do with those deer? They're going to eat them. Mm-hmm. Okay, you've got a whole bunch of trophy hunters. I was on the island several years ago, mm-hmm. there were a bunch of outfitters. Okay. And I, re- I had a tag for bull elk. At daybreak, opening day, it sounded like the first day of World War I. Hmm. Boom, 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 boom. I came across a guy gutting a six-point elk. 
he was guide and outfitter. Mm. It's broken down into regions and areas. And they had tags for two elk in each one of the areas. They'd taken six elk down in one area. Oh, great. He's gutting this magnificent six-point elk. I said, got talking to him. I said, where's the hunter? Oh, he's back at the hotel. Oh, he'll on. be He'll be here shortly, right? Yeah. So... We got talking, and I said, "He said, I said, yeah, he needs, to, he wants to get his picture taken with it." And then uh, I said, "What's he taking back with him?" Oh, just the rack. Jeez. Well, what happens to the meat? Oh, we'll take it. That's yeah. the system. Three years ago, I was up in the area we hunt in the Kootenays, which I can always go in, and I know. Basically, every fa every deer family there. Mm -hmm. And taking up for our, our hunt, we go in there. And I know every little bend, everything there. Last time I was there, I was coming along this little trail where I drive with the Jeep. Oh, there's a grouse. So I've got brake action shotgun in the back of the Jeep, and I got couple of shells there and I'll just pop out and pop that gross. When all of a sudden there's a huge four by four crew cab in front of me with six people. Okay. Never seen one there. I, this is a road I could have got a flat tire. I could be there for weeks. <laughs> right. And as I, I can't shoot the grouse, so I have to pull up on the side so he can get by me and he stops and what are you guys hunting? Whitetail. Oh, Interesting. All these people in the truck. So, okay, fine. So I go down to where the lake is. And as I get down to where the lake, which is a no-go area, uh, because I've got this dis disabled permit, I'm allowed to go on roads that you can't hunt on. Sure. There's two white trucks, and I would say 15 deer hanging Jeez. in the trees. And these guys are skinning them. And they've got containers there, and they're loading all the meat in the container. So I back up, go another way. I run into another white truck. But this guy's talkative, and I've got some questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Hi. You know, I notice there's flagging tape of different colors all over the place. So I said, oh, you guys after whitetail. Oh, yeah. He said, uh, elk season finished. And he said, uh, the deal here, he said, uh, we've got all these people coming in from out of the country. And um, it's a sure deal. It's uh, one antlerless, one antlered. So they get a sure kill. They're driving. Wow. And basically, they must have, in, in two days, they just wiped out the entire population of deer. Yeah, and that's frustrating, extremely mm -hmm. frustrating. And the conservation people won't do anything about it because they're outfitters. So in you talked earlier about an indigenous group will go out and they'll hunt and they will provide for those who can't hunt, yeah. who can't be there. Does that play into bag limits? Does that play into, like if you see one hunter and he's got several deer in the back of the truck... Is that because that... It, it's possible. Um, I share basically um, the, the animals that I get. Mm -hmm. We've got a freezer. I'm not a uh, <laughs> huge carnivore that I eat meat three times a day. So, mm -hmm. you know, 300 pounds of elk is going to last a long time. Sure. So I have people that are grateful to, to have it. Mm-hmm. And can't, for one reason or another, hunt. Mm -hmm. They're either elderly, but again, uh, it could be. But again, there could be people abusing the system, and this happens on both sides. Sure, say. sure. So you have to be aware of, if you don't know the circumstance, yeah, you could get upset. Mm -hmm. But what's the action, you know, as they say, you know, if you don't know the full circumstances of what's going on, and... If you really want to know, you can ask. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you can become acquainted. Mm -hmm. You see, I, I think a lot of people don't understand. And I, you know, if you would spend some time with these communities and with these people, you get a better understanding of what, what a lot of these people are dealing with. Sure. You know, up in the Chilcote, and the kids go to school to grade seven. Okay. Then the high school is in Williams Lake. So they have to go to Williams Lake. Hmm. A lot of them fall in with gangs, fall in with, you know, and let's say the kid's a success. And he goes to university and gets a degree. Where's he going to get a job back home? <laughs> That's, that is a good point. Yeah. So you'd have to leave the community. So, yeah. So some of the chiefs that I know, they're working hard to start logging companies. Like with uh, Wet'suwet'en, mm -hmm. you know, this pipeline is a employment opportunity that people will be able to have jobs and stay in the community in which they were born. Hmm. Do you know, I was growing up in Winnipeg. It's an interesting province. When I was growing up, there were a million people in the province. Half of them lived in Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Give you an idea, when my dad had a stroke and he was in the hospital, at the same time, a chief from up north had had a heart attack and he was flowing down to the Winnipeg General. And the whole waiting room was full of people from his reserve. Really? <laughs> yeah. They were camped out there. Huh. That's the bond that they have. That's fantastic. You know, well, it was, except... They'd emptied uh, the drink machine and uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything else. I guess that goes with it. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, you've got to look at a group that, yes, they were given a lot of stuff, but in a way, were they given the right stuff? Sure. There's a book called Dancing with Dependence. Okay. It's interesting of what happens when basically a, a people are given a whole bunch of things and what they become dependent on. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you know, what, what, what have they got? You know, cheap, cheap gas, cheap cigarettes. So in the case of this instructor who's otherwise well-received when he's training these courses to non-Indigenous groups, what are some tips that I could come back for for this person? Be humble. Don't come off as a end all, be all, mm -hmm. know it all. Mm -hmm. you know, come in a little bit humble. And if you can find a nexus, a bridge that they can relate to you, because you're coming in as a stranger. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt. You go to somebody's house. You compliment them. Sure. Nice house you got here. Sure. I like your garden. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing. Okay. You go in and, you know, you've got nice territory here. You know, I love, you know, the water, you know, the things that you have. Mm -hmm. Do a little bit of background. And find out a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. You know, this helps. If you learn about your enemies and you learn about your friends. Sure. That helps you both ways. The more you know, the the more the more you're armed. There's a, a a bit of native humor, but you have to sort of know a little bit about it. The the best humor that you can do in those is humor of yourself. Sure. Right. In other words, take yourself down a peg. You know, and all, when I was doing songs, you know. And, you know that you're not perfect, and people will accept you. As I say, they they are accepting. What I like to learn is a little bit of their language. That's a good point. Um, <laughs> shows you care. Shows you put some time. Yeah, a lot of the native languages look like tongue twisters. Sure, and they can be. The Chilcotin language is kind of funny because it has tongue tongue ticking okay. in it. Takes a little while. The last one I saw like that was in Africa. But again, if you can just do something, even a greeting, just like hello. And the, the humor, when I was up in the Chilcotin, there's a, 
there's a place of it. I got to watch my pronunciation, but there's a place called Red Cliff. Okay. Say Daldel. But if you don't say it right, it can come out in their language as red fart instead of <laughs> red, red cliff. So, you know. So they're either impressed with you or they're having a good laugh at you. Well, this was it. They were having a laugh. This was an RCMP officer who came in and tried to say some things. I mean, they, they laughed at him, but in a way they were laughing with him, not mm -hmm. really at him. And I said, do you realize what you just said? <laughs> but, you know, I, I found this when I was in the army dealing with different languages. You, you know, you look at, for example, I give the people an example of uh, the word gâteau. Sure. Gâteau in French means cake. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gâteau in Spanish means cat. Right. So watch what you ask for dessert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. You know, I was in Fran uh, France with a Spanish couple, and she got the giggles every time somebody asked for café au lait. <laughs> <laughs> so language can be kind of difficult, but dealing with Native people can be very illuminating at times. For example, you'll see a lot of names that you would think, like, I have a friend, Randy Billy Boy. Right. Last name's Billy Boy. Well, that's kind of derogatory, isn't it? You know, kind of belittling. Sure. Because there's a Charlie Boy, Billy Boy. Right, yeah. You know, Johnny Boy, right? So you, you look at that. Doing the alternative certifications, one of the last names is Sam. Okay. So this fellow came in, and he must have been in his 90s, and he said, doing the alternative certification. So he said, Phil, he said, do you want to see my papers? Well, this guy had brought documents going back like 100 years. Oh, jeez. <laughs> right? Yes, I'm interested. I mean, I could insult him by saying, no, I, I don't need to see your papers. Right. So I accommodate him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see your papers. You know what I learned? Tell me. Well, on his dad's birth certificate, his dad's name was Big Sam. Okay. So the guy who filled it out, his Christian name was Big, his surname was Sam. <laughs> that's funny. And that's how the name came down. Huh. So the, the surname for all the children was Sam. Interesting. Um, I had the most delightful one where I went up to um, uh, Honikotin, where, yeah. you know, the wild horses are. And uh, I had this little old lady come in doing uh, questions on alternatives. Uh, do you own a, a firearm? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, what kind of firearm? 22. Okay. Do you hunt? Yeah. What do you hunt? Moose. <laughs> you hunt moose with the 22. And she looks at me incredulously like, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, isn't that hard? Oh. Hard part's getting the moose back to the cabin. <laughs> okay. So uh, I said, so do you shoot just moose? No, I sometimes shoot bears. Yeah. Oh, yeah, bears get into my garden and uh, you know, I shoot the bears. It's a 22. What's 22. Where do you keep a 22? Under the bed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Susie, what? Where were you born? In a wagon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, wh whereabouts were you born? Up a valley. <laughs> okay. You are born up the valley in a wagon. Okay. Uh, what's your birthday? Don't know. Yeah. What does it say on your birth certificate? Don't have one. Sure. Any idea how old you are? Mm, I think maybe 80. Some people say more. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll check the band records. Okay. Um, do you have a, like any other, like a, were you baptized? Oh, yeah. Do you have a baptism certificate? Uh, no. Hmm. When were you baptized? Uh, same time my parents got married. <laughs> and so what happened there? Oh, well, the priest came into town, you know, came, came to the village, and uh, my parents got married and... The six kids got baptized. Yeah. Okay. You know, this is what you're dealing with. Then I go back to 
you know, Ottawa, and they say, uh, can't give this lady her papers because you didn't put her birth date down. She doesn't have one. Hmm. Well, you didn't put a phone number down for them. Didn't have a phone number. Exactly. Uh, they would say, uh, we need an address. Well, it's General Delivery Hatsville. Mm-hmm. No, no, we, we, have to, we, we have to have the actual address. Where did they pick up their mail? General Delivery Hansville. Mm-hmm. Somebody goes into Hansville and they bring back the mail for everybody. Mm-hmm. No, we need a location. Well, I can give you the hydro pole. <laughs> hydro poles have all the locations on them. That's right. And they're probably happy to take that. No. No? Ottawa, no. We need an address. So I go back to the village and get the chief and said, okay, uh, I'm going to put your address down as number one Beaver Street. <laughs> oh, okay. I said, I was going to use number 10 Downing Street, but I <laughs> thought they might question it. Oh, that's funny. So his permit, you know, firearms license comes back with his address. His mailing address is General Delivery Hansville. His address is number one Beaver Street. <laughs> Next time I go into the reserve, I notice that all the houses have numbers on them now, one, one to ten. So they do it, but it satisfied Ottawa. Ah, oh, sheesh. You know, and they can't, they kept saying to me, well, what happens if somebody needs an ambulance? I said, well, they call an ambulance. Somebody goes out to the highway, drives out to the highway to the pay phone. Mm-hmm. And they phone an ambulance. Well, if they don't have an address, how, how will they find the person? I said, the person gets in the ambulance with the ambulance drivers and <laughs> takes them back. Oh, well, I said, don't worry. The ambulance drivers are native too. Right. Well, well, how do you find them? I said, I drive in. There's a guy walking on the road. Can you tell me where Jerry Smith lives? And oh, yeah, down by the lake, he's the house with the red roof. Perfect. And I said, sometimes they'll jump in and ride along with me. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, um, but the bureaucracy in Ottawa, uh, we need a birth certificate. We need, you know, what does it say on your passport? <laughs> and, you know, what have you got for ID? Lot, they, do, You know, a lot of them, and because of what we discussed earlier, because of the lack of alternative certification and the unavailability to have a firearms course up there mm-hmm. and the fellow up there who brought up as an instructor he does his best sure but again they could sure use an alternative certifier oh they definitely could now when you're talking about understanding and being humble i remember geez what is it about 20 years ago i was teaching up north native band I was used to having very strict timings with my courses. So I fly in, I'm there, I'm up early, and I'm waiting for everyone to show up. And there I am twiddling my thumbs wondering, am I in the right area? What's going on? Finally, one person shows up and I said, where's everybody else? They're not here, was the answer I got. They're not here. Oh, okay. When are they coming? I don't know. Probably when they get up. (laughs) Okay, so a couple hours go by and pretty much everyone comes on in and it was it was an eye opener for me just to be more understanding to different cultures in so much as, you know, these people, they had the experience and it was a firearms related course. They had experience of firearms, the laws and some of the um, technicalities and some of the safety practices uh, would be new to them. But by the time we finished a course, I ended up just going later. I, I caught a different flight on uh, a couple of days later. I just, I basically parked all my preconceptions at the, uh, at the door and figured, let's just have some fun with this. We'll go through, we'll do the course on their time. And, and they loved it. They had it. They had a great time. One thing that stuck out was on testing. Cause you mentioned, as opposed to having a test, just say, look, I got some questions for you. See, I didn't have that knowledge yeah. and I'm going through testing and the responses I was getting back one-on-one doing testing. And part of this one, they had to cross an obstacle and you know, that whole drill. Yeah. Okay. We've got, we've got a fence here. We've got to cross it. 
Why? <laughs> well, just show me how you'd safely do that with this firearm. Well, is there an animal on the other side? Am I hunting? <laughs> no, you're crossing an obstacle. Well, if there's no animal, I'm not going to cross. <laughs> I, had, I had a similar one. I had a fellow. He said, okay, um, now you, you come to the fence. Yeah. What are you going to do? Look for a gate. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, so there is no gate. Then I won't cross the fence. <laughs> Why not? Well, I got a bad knee. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't argue with that logic. No. But you see, they're, they're looking at it. When I was um, at one of the other sites, I had to adapt. Mm. Because, you know, what are the firing positions? Sure. I said to one young fellow, I said, okay, so name me two firing positions. Leaning and resting. I said, can you describe them? <laughs> sure. Well, that's like where I have to lean against the tree to shoot. Yeah. Or sometimes there's a stump and I have to rest my rifle on stuff. Okay. Valid. So there's different ones. I was up in the Arctic doing the one that, okay, you're going to cross a fence. And I got this blank stare. And my interpreter said, there's no word in our language for fence. Oh, interesting. I said, come off it. You got a word in your language for Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then of course they all, they all laugh because, yeah. you know. so okay so again they, they've altered the exam so you can do other things mm -hmm. but the accommodation some of the stories I hear you know where they failed exams Sure. and, and it, what happens is people don't go like this one fellow I had, I had to redo him when I went up there and I said so what happened he said well I failed on ammunition okay I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the instructor handed me this cartridge and he said, can you tell me what this cartridge is? And he said, no. Okay. Okay. So he handed me another cartridge and he said, can you identify this? No. He put it down, failed. Hmm. So I said, I, I did the next question. I said, why couldn't you identify them? He said, well, that ammunition was so beat up, you couldn't read the numbers on it. <laughs> yeah. Again, if somebody doesn't know the answer, you need to maybe go the extra step and say, why? That's a good point. Why can't you? Because you, you have to remember that these are people that are linked to the land. Mm -hmm. They're not academics. They're not. Greek philosophers. Mm -hmm. They're people who, it reminds me of a university professor that I met. Him and his wife were both university professors. And they went, decided to take a sabbatical and fly into northern BC to a remote area and live there for a year okay. with their teenage children to show them what it was like. Okay. Okay. Bought a whole bunch of firearms and one thing and another. So he said, they just flown in in, oh, I guess August, and in the cabin for a few days, and Indian family shows up, mother, father, bunch of kids, and he invites them to stay. In a matter of a couple of weeks, they, they don't go away. They stay, and they basically eat all the food <laughs> that they can. Sure. And then they said... We got to go. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a little bit horrified that these people have eaten most of the, you know, good portion of their supplies. And he sure. said, uh, oh, but may maybe you could look after my daughter. She's about six. They're going to leave the daughter with them. Yeah. And he said, what do you mean? He said, you people know how to read and write. Can you teach my daughter to read and write? Wow. So he said, okay, can we think about it? Oh, yeah. So the next morning they're gone and the little kid's left. Wow. They have the little kid with them. And the little kid is showing them how to hunt grouse. <laughs> I love it. Takes them out. They don't even see it. Hmm. The kid knows all sorts of stuff. So they're teaching it, teaching the young girl how to read and write and, you know, basic homeschooling stuff. Big, you know, 
Anyways, about a month later, the family shows up with a moose. Here. <laughs> wow. And then they disappear again, and they're never seen. Jeez. <laughs> and so you, you look at that, and during reserve times, they had a, a big problem because the Indians at the time of treaty times were very communal. Okay. The, the band looked after the band. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was they gave each member in the band so many cattle and it was flour, sugar, and tea, whatnot. And some of them just slaughtered the animals. Okay. And then they had no animals. So they'd ask the other ones that had animals, can I have your animals? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and before long, there were no animals. <laughs> right. Right? What happened to them? Gave them away. And that's another part of the culture that, that's very interesting. No kidding. So who steps in but the church? Don't give your stuff to them. Give your money to the church, and the church <laughs> will look after. Sure. In... in my culture where I grew up, if somebody admired something, you had to give it to them. Interesting. In the Lakota culture, there's a couple of, well, you, you sort of call them weird things. Uh, one of the things that's traditional in our hunt is a hunter who gets their first animal has to give it away. That's an interesting tradition. Well... Can you imagine we've got young children who get their first deer mm -hmm. and they give it away? Mm -hmm. But I've never seen any of the kids regret it. No, it teaches to be a part of the community, yeah. to give back. It teaches a lot of really good things. Yeah. To work hard for something and realize that someone else could probably use it more than you. Yeah. And it shows a type of generosity and, again, it usually given to an elder or somebody who's helped them, right? And the thing is that, um, well, there's another thing that I have, that you can't give a gift away. <laughs> Once you receive a gift, you can't give it away. Yeah. No re-gifting. Yeah. Okay. In other words, the gift is yours, but it's, it's not like you can re-gift it. What if somebody shows admiration of that gift? That's... Rules don't apply. No. Okay. I guess there's exemptions. <laughs> I guess so. But um, I was, there There are exemptions, and I was given a polar bear claw. Okay. The fellow who gave it to me was one of my students. Okay. And it was kind of interesting. The funny story goes with it. It was admired by a young fellow. Okay. Who was about eight years old. And when he gifted me his deer. The eight-year-old. Yeah, I gave him the claw. Uh, but I'd forgot to do something. What's that? Well, this is interesting. So I gave him the claw. And that was back in 2007. I went in for a heart procedure. Okay. And while I was undergoing the heart procedure over in Victoria, he went running to his father. And he said, there's something wrong with that claw. Okay. He, uh, what do you mean? He said, it's, it's, you know, basically, you know, moving. Okay. And he's, and his dad looked at it and he said, yeah, I know why. He said, Marshall, look after that when he gets back. So when I got back, what I had to do was... We believe that when you have something that's personal, it becomes part of you, and it's called tun. Okay. It's spelled like tun, tun. It has your tun. Okay. And what you have to do is, because it belongs to you, it basically, if you give it to another person, you have to release the ton and tell the item that it no longer belongs to you, it belongs to the other person. Interesting. So we had to go through a ceremony whereby uh, we did smudging. Okay. 
And basically, there's a small ritual you go through where you explain to the spirit. Because we figure in the culture that even inanimate objects have a spirit. Interesting. So, in a way, everything has a spirit. And as I say, you know, the young fellow was saying, you know, what my chest, you know, when I wear it, my chest hurts. Ah. So anyways, we went through the re releasing the ton. The same thing is done with the scalping ceremony. Okay. Taking a scalp is personal part of person. And uh, if you want, you know, basically with Plains Indian, uh, there's a releasing of the spirit. And that's what we do with our prayer uh, in the hunt. We release the animal spirit to mm -hmm. return to whence, wherever it came from. You thank the animal. You thank the animal's community. Yeah. And also we go through cleansing so that the place is a place of life and not a place of death. So how does that cleansing work? Uh, usually tobacco and uh, you're working on the premise of circle of life. Okay. That, you know, the blood, the, you know, the remnants of the guts are nourishment for other things. Mm. So, in effect, you know, the stuff that you leave behind, which we jokingly call the bits. Okay. <laughs> the bits. Yeah. You leave the bits. Um, you know, they're consumed, and we know now there's bacteria, there's insects, and, of course, we have, you know, the interesting fact that the other animals basically prosper. Mm -hmm. On one of our hunts, my son, years ago, was drove a white, you know, pickup, which was kind of unique years ago because there weren't that many white pickups. And my son and my friend were in that truck. Anyways, they went out, got a, got a deer, there were two ravens got on the gut pile. The funny part was we drove out the next morning to the same area, and there were two ravens waiting, and they followed John's truck. And when they got out of the truck, they were circling, hmm. and they went over to where they were, and there was a herd of deer. So Interesting. they got the next deer, and third day, drove in, Ravens were waiting. <laughs> and it was like, oh, there they are. And they would follow the truck. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So you have to sort of look at it and you think, is there, you know, basically, you know, a messenger? We go through in, in the native rituals about, call them spirit animals or spirit guides. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and everybody who goes through the rituals will have some sort of guide. Mm -hmm. Lots of interesting stories on down at Wounded Knee. I'm trying to think of the fellow's name, but uh, anyways, he went through a spirit quest, mm -hmm. got into a dream, and all he saw was worms. Huh. And he thought, creator, like, am I going to end up with worms as my spirit? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what about a wolf and, or something? Anyways, he, he, he delve into it a little more, which is basically sensual deprivation, lack of sleep and hunger and you know, thirst and whatnot. Anyways, finally, it was revealed with a buffalo. So mm. he said, thank goodness, you know, my spirit <laughs> animal. And he said, I didn't want to go through life with worms as my spirit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you very much for giving me your time. Thank you very much for being here on this podcast. I really appreciate that and having well, me in your you. home. Well, it's good to talk to somebody who has like feelings. So. <laughs>